hope. And what we're going to hopefully do is, is um, see the only true um, reliable place where hope can be found in a world uh, where uncertainty and fear seems to be growing nearly every day. As human beings, one of the things that we all experience in life is fear, isn't it? Often fear is an unwanted emotion that can make us feel uncomfortable. And that's why we spend a lot of time trying to minimise the risk of bad things happening or unwanted things happening in our lives as a way of reducing our fear. By far the majority of the fear that we, that we all face, or the fears that we face in life, are, are to do with things that are in the future or future events. As humans, we may fear things happening in the future that are out of our control, like losing our job or getting sick or losing money. There are many things that we may fear. As humans, we don't cope too well with uncertainty. We like to know that things will pan out smoothly and the way that we want them to pan out. And that's where hope comes into play. Hope is the cure for fear. And as humans, we tend to use hope as a way of countering our fear. Just like fear, our hopes are to do with things in the future. And our hopes can be used to fill up our uncertainties in life with a vision of better days to come. In our world, there are many forms and shapes that hope can take and many things that we can place our hope in. One way that we can, um, one thing that we can place our hope in is people or we can put our hope in, in leaders. Many will no doubt remember in 2009, which doesn't seem that long ago, when Barack Obama was voted in as the first African-American Prime Minister, or President, I should say. And it came at a time when the nation had just gone through a, a recession um, following the financial crisis, which left many people, or many families, under financial stress that they hadn't um, had to deal with previously. And it left people um, without, without hope, without much hope. But here came a new president who preached hope to a nation whose fear was increasing. And his catch cry was, yes, we can. And he talked about restoring the American dream. He talked about making America great again and making it the, the best place to live on earth. And I remember watching the joy that people had that day when he became president. Strangers were hugging in the streets. There was tears of joy in the streets because they now had someone who they could place their hope on. But a few years on and, and people quickly started to realise that despite the message of hope that this new president had preached, their problems hadn't suddenly disappeared. They all still remained. And now they have a president called Donald Trump who isn't exactly filling a nation full of, with, filled with hope, is he? So it's a normal thing for people to rest um, their hope in, in other people or leaders who promise for better days to come. But often the outcomes don't match the promises made, do they? Another thing that we can choose to place our hope in is in things or possessions. Money is one place where people can place their hope and trust. Having more money can offer, offer more security in life. If we have enough money in the bank, then our future will, will be secure. We will have enough money to, um, to afford an education for our children. We may feel like if we accumulate enough money, then we can ensure that we'll always have food in the fridge and that we'll always have enough money to pay our bills. If we have enough money, then we can look ahead to retirement and feel secure. And we can feel like we've got enough money to, to live comfortably in retirement. And people can spend a lot of time and effort accumulating more and more wealth. They can invest in different ways to gain more wealth. Invest in property, in shares, in all different areas with the hope that with greater possessions or greater wealth will, become, will come 
more security and less fear. In a similar way, people can place their hope in their careers, in building a successful career, starting with getting a good university degree and then maybe climbing up, um, climbing up the, the corporate ladder and, and in that way they can secure their futures and so they can have everything that they need to survive in life. Insurance is a big thing, isn't it? We can pay a small price today as a way of securing and taking preventative measures for bad things happening, as a way of reducing fear. Things like um, crushing cars or, or our house being caught on fire and burning down or something like that, we can insure ourselves even if we get injured or we get sick and then, and then we can't make any money. So these are all things, all fears that people invest in and they, they spend time trying to find the answer for. As humans, we're constantly looking for people or things that we can place our hope in to reduce uncertainty and fear of bad things happening to us. But none of this seems to be working very effectively. Because everywhere we look, fear and anxiety seems to be winning the battle against hope. In Australia alone, in one year, around one million adults will have depression and over two million will, will suffer with anxiety. Now we're all probably familiar with what depression is, but anxiety is defined as a mental health disorder characterised by feelings of worry, anxiety, um, or fear that are strong enough to interfere with one's daily activities. And that's in Australia where we live in relative peace, don't we, compared to other places in the world. And we're blessed with more wealth and security than just about any other place in the world. But even in our country, <coughs> fear exists and hope seems to be failing many people. But that's probably to be expected when we consider the state of our world. The title of tonight is In a Scary World, the Bible Offers Hope. And not many people could argue that we do in fact live in a scary world, or at least in a scarier world than five or, or ten years ago. In the last five to ten years, there's been a marked growth in terrorism. This year alone, we've read of devastations in places like Spain, the, the Spanish terror attack, where a van ploughed through a, a popular strip killing 13 people. There was the London Bridge terror attack, where Australians were amongst those um, killed. There was the attack at a concert in Manchester that, that we might, may remember, where 22 people um, died and many, many more were injured. In the last couple of days, there's been another attack in England where many people have been injured and fear is growing. Um, I read today that, um, that U2, the, one of the world's biggest bands, has just cancelled one of their upcoming concerts in England for fear of another terrorist attack. And there have, of course, been many, many shocking events fuelled by terrorism in previous years. And it seems that it will continue to happen more and more. It's slowly spreading fear right across the, gro right ac across the globe, even to a peaceful country like Australia. And that's exactly what it's designed to do, isn't it? That's exactly what terrorism is designed to do. It's designed to put fear into people, to make people question the safety of going about their normal daily lives, about going to places they want to go to. The current level of threat of a terrorism event taking place in Australia, um, which is given to us by the, the government or the National Security, uh, National Security Agency, um, is that it is probable. That's the current risk to Australia of a terrorist attack. It is probable. Or in other words, it's more likely than not 
that a terrorism event, just like the events that we've seen overseas, will happen on our shores in the foreseeable future. It's more likely than not. Incredible. And that's even with all the money and the resources um, used to counter threats to, of, of terrorism. On the National Security website, it states this. It says, credible intelligence assessed by our security agencies indicates that individuals or groups continue to possess the intent and capability to conduct a terrorist attack in Australia. The public should continue to exercise caution. So our government in Australia have been very open with the fact that they do not have the capacity to, um, to rule out any threat of terrorism. There's been many occasions where um, they have been able to stop, stop terrorist attacks happening before, um, before they do happen. But they've said that, that it's unlikely that they're going to be able to rule out every threat that comes from terrorism. And so as if um, terrorism or the threat of terrorism wasn't bad enough, we've been witnessing recently, haven't, haven't we, a barrage of threats from two, um, two world superpowers, really, America and North Korea, whose leaders are certainly not characters who tend to um, exercise um, constraint or caution with what they do and say. And there is a very real possibility of nuclear war breaking out at any time, really, and where millions of lives um, will be under threat in a matter of mi minutes if that happens, especially in places like South Korea and Japan. Other nations are trying hard to defuse these tensions between America and North Korea, but it seems that no number of international sanctions against North Korea will stop them from conducting more weapons tests, will it? Um, North Korea have been very open about the fact that their plan and their goal is to very quickly match the United States of America in terms of their army's capabilities. They want to be a match for America and that is their, there is, that is their intent. And it's a scary proposition. And whatever patience that Donald Trump has must surely be running thin and war may be seen to be the only option to defend their national security. There is no doubt that this is a scary world that we are living in. And who knows what state this world will be in five or ten years' time from now if it's allowed um, or left to its own devices. It's hard to imagine a more peaceful world than it is right now, isn't it? We would assume that it's only going to escalate from this point forward um, as we see these, all, these, all these things happening in our news. It seems that there's little hope that world leaders have a solution as well. There's no man or leader that has the answer to the trouble that the world is facing at the moment. The hope that diplomacy will be the solution to these issues is becoming less and less likely. And the hopeless situation that the world is in is feeding fear and insecurity across the world. So is there anywhere that man can turn to for hope in this scary world? Well, the answer, as we'll see tonight, is found in the Bible. The Bible talks a lot about hope. And tonight we're going to have a look at what the Bible says about this hope and how that hope can be obtained. Hopefully what we'll see is that the hope that is found in the Bible is the answer for anyone living with uncertainty or anxiety or fear in this scary world. Hope described in the Bible is uh, very different to the hope that, um, that we see in our world. It's very, very different. Hope described in the Bible is available to anyone in any country on earth living in the very best conditions or in the most trying and difficult conditions. I think the most incredible thing about this hope described in the Bible is that it can provide comfort 
peace and even joy to individuals living through the most trying of circumstances in life. That's what this hope in the Bible can provide. It can stand up to any circumstance of hardship that we face in life and it will never desert us. The hope found in the Bible has nothing to do with having great things or being success stories in this life that we are now living. The hope in the Bible does not guarantee that our life will be fantastic or that we will have a good job or that we'll be blessed with um, lots of money and lots of, lots of good things. It certainly doesn't make us immune to trials and hardships such as illness or ridicule from others or even persecution in some parts of the world. But it is a source of strength to anyone going through trials or hardship. Let's have a look um, in, the, in the reading that we had tonight in First Peter. had a few verses there. Um, in this book of, of First Peter, uh, we read a lot about hope. Peter, the, the author who's writing this letter, um, is writing this to different ecclesias or churches who were spread across Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And the situation that Peter is writing um, to these people is a very difficult one because these believers were going through a lot of fear and uncertainty when he wrote these letters. And the source of that fear was persecution that was um, being handed out to Christians um, that was authorised from, from Rome. And there was a very real chance that any of these believers who Peter's writing to could be arrested, could be hurled into jail or even killed for their beliefs. That, that's the environment of, that Peter is writing this letter. And no doubt it was a scary time for all these people. It was, it's a scary time for us now when we look at the things that are around us, but it was certainly a very scary time for these people. And there would have been a feeling of great fear and, and uncertainty. But Peter is writing this letter to these faithful believers, trying to encourage them through hope. He's going he's to talk to them about hope. Although their situation seems uh, very grievous, they were far from being without hope. Let's read First Peter 1 verse 3 through to verse 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What an incredible message of hope that is to these believers. What Peter does is he lifts their thoughts from their current situation or current problems and, and reveals to them or speaks to them about an incorruptible inheritance that was waiting for all of them. And we'll, we'll touch more on that a little bit later, the incorruptible inheritance. He says that this hope is a lively hope or a living hope. Even though their situation seemed hopeless, hope was far from lost. It was a living hope that they had. And notice um, how that Peter describes this hope as being something that will never let them down. He says that that hope would never fade away. In fact, so much so that it was reserved in heaven and that they were being kept or protected by God himself. There was nothing more certain for these believers than this incorruptible inheritance that was waiting for them. That's the message that Peter gives to them. No man could take that away from them. No person who was going to um, possibly arrest them or throw them in jail would have any power at all to take that hope from them because God himself was protecting it 
and it was reserved in heaven. Now that's a very different hope to hopes in this world. We can all have different hopes, can't we? Um, but there's nothing certain about any of them. Even our greatest hopes and our greatest desires in the world contain an ele element of doubt, don't they? They can be taken away from us in an instant. Any hope placed in life is, is subject to uncertainty because it can be taken away in an instant. And we all know probably of, of tragic stories of, of people whose lives have, um, have been taken in such an instant, in a moment of time, so suddenly. But hope in the Bible is something that cannot be taken away from anyone or cannot be taken by anyone or anything. This hope is protected by God. Now Jesus talked about a similar thing. Let's just go to, to Matthew. We'll look at Matthew chapter 6. verse 19 of Matthew 6 Jesus says lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal for where your treasure is there will your heart be also Jesus here is he's talking about the dangers of loving money and, and possessions. That's the, the background to, to these verses here. And he, he's talking about the danger of putting hope in money and, and, um, and these possessions. And the point that Jesus makes here is that if we invest all our energy and all our time into any earthly thing like money, then we're going to be left disappointed. Because there's no security to any of them. Those things can be taken away from us and they don't offer any certainty at all. In fact, often the more money and, the, and more possessions that we have, the more time we spend worrying about them, don't we? The more time we spend worrying that we're actually going to lose them. And all we can think about is how we're going to protect our money and our wealth. And Jesus says that there's no certainty to any of those things at all. King Solomon echoed similar words when he talked about money and possessions as well. Now, King Solomon had more money and possessions than any man on earth when he was king. There was nothing off limits to him at all. But when he looked back on everything that he had and everything that he was able to achieve and accomplish, he said that it was all vanity. He said it was, it's all empty. He said that finding meaning and satisfaction through... Worldly pursuits was like running and trying to catch the wind. It was useless. It was frustrating. And one of the things that Solomon struggled with the most was the fact that a man could work his whole life and spend his whole life gathering more and more money, more and more wealth and more and more possessions. But at the end of it, he would ultimately pass all of that on to someone else to inherit and he said that who knows if that person who all of that stuff that has been worked so hard to get, whether they're going to be a wise person and use that stuff wisely or whether they're going to be a fool and they're just going to waste it all. And Solomon saw the vanity in it. At the end of the day, we arrive in this world with nothing and we leave with nothing. And Solomon saw the vanity in that. What a waste of energy when we put our trust in and our hope in money and possessions. But many do, don't they? And Jesus in Matthew talks about a different treasure. One that, that is found in heaven. And it's the same hope that Peter's referring to, to the believers in his letter. Jesus says that we're much better putting our time and energy into riches that are secure. That no one can break in and steal. That things that aren't going to lose their value over time. Those riches are our eternal hope that's found in the Bible. It is a hope that's protected and kept by God himself. We'll flick back over to 1 Peter. 
and we'll read on some of these encouraging words that, that Peter has about this hope. He touches on this suffering that, that obviously was on, was on, the, on um, the people's mind at this time. In verse 6, he says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now, as we, we talked about er, earlier, um, hope does not mean that we're immune to hardship in this life. And that was certainly the case with the believers who are receiving this letter. But as Peter says, that the hope that the Bible offers can transcend suffering. The joy of a living hope is independent to situations or circumstances in life. That's the effect that it can have on our life. We won't turn this up, but in Romans 8 verse 18 we read, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The glory that is to come, which is reserved in heaven and kept by God, is so great that no amount of suffering in this life can compare to it. It's a complete mismatch. Now we can look around and we can see some extreme cases of suffering. And we may wonder how people deal with some things that, that they have to suffer with in life. Um, tragedies that people deal with. Think about the example of, of Job. Job, who lost children, who was struck down with a terrible illness, who had friends, his closest friends, and even his wife telling him that there must have been some terrible sin that, that he's done to deserve all this that, that is coming to him. What a terrible thing. But even all that suffering cannot be compared to the glory that is to come. All that suffering, like someone that Job um, went through, is not even worthy to be compared to the glory that is to come, um, which is the hope in the Bible. And so what it illustrates is just how great that hope is that, res that is reserved in heaven for those who, who love God. We go over to John John chapter 3. There's a couple of verses here that really describe for us the foundation of our hope. Or the foundation of, of hope in the Bible. John 3 verse... Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, if there was one verse or a couple of verses that, that summarise the foundation of our hope, then that's a really good one there. There have been many faithful men and women who after living a faithful life to the end have passed away. But they haven't perished. That's what we're told there. They haven't perished. They died in faith knowing that one day their hope would be realised. That living hope would come. And God sent his son to save and not to condemn. He didn't send his son to the world to, um, as a way of, of making the world guilty for their sins, but he sent with a purpose of saving. And through Jesus' death and now resurrection, salvation and hope has come to the world, a hope that goes beyond our lives now. Jeremiah 17 verse 7 says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. One of the great things about the hope in the Bible is that it's a hope that's taken care of. We don't have to worry that something's going to happen to it, that we have to protect it or that it's going to lose its value or that someone might take it from us. We are called to place our trust in God 
and to place our hope in our Father. He is reserving an everlasting inheritance for those who do that. Let's come back to First Peter. Because Peter now goes into a little bit more detail about this hope. We'll read from verse 23 of 1 Peter 1. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth for ever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of, the, of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So one thing is certain, isn't it? And and it's something that we have known ever since we came into this world. And that is that life comes and life goes. That's a certainty. As dying creatures we live, some a long life and others a shorter life, but we all die with our mortal natures. And in that way, life is like a flower, isn't it? That comes out in full bloom. And life seems so full and vibrant, but eventually that flower begins to wilt. And its vibrancy starts to wear away till eventually it dies. That's how life goes, if we're lucky enough to live a full life. We've inherited this from Adam. <coughs> And we all, we all know this. But as Peter reminds the believers across Asia Minor, there is a, there is a different seed. There's a, there's a different inheritance. An incorruptible seed that liveth and abideth forever. And this seed is made up of men and women who have been born again. That's what Peter says. Our first birth, or our natural birth, is what everyone has been born into. We've all been born, haven't we? But we can be born again. It's an interesting concept, being born again. When Jesus um, discussed this in his ministry, someone, someone said to him, you know, should I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? But of course that's not what it means. But this is how we gain access to, to hope. And anyone can be born again into this incorruptible family tree. To be born again requires belief and baptism, which is a transformation that takes place in a believer's life, which leads to a different walk. It's a walk in Jesus' footsteps, following his example of selflessness and serving others rather than serving ourselves. That's how we're born again. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, we read... But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since, by me, for since by man came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. What an incredible hope that's revealed in the Bible that is available to anyone. It's a hope of an everlasting inheritance in a world that is very different to the world that we live in today. There will be a complete transformation that takes place on this earth like never before. There will be no more war or fear that's everywhere now. There will be no more tragedies. There will be no more pain and no more suffering and sadness. The world will be filled with God's characteristics of love, of mercy of righteousness. There will be no more injustice fuelled by by man's greed. All of that will be done away with. That's the inheritance that God is keeping for those who love him. But that's not all the benefits that come with this hope. Sure, there are incredible things to come in in the life to come. But there are also benefits to us now in this life. God has promised to be a source of strength in this life for all who place their hope and trust in him. That means no matter what happens to us, no matter 
what hardships we face, we can know that God is right there with us because God never deserts those who he loves. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 8 and just and read about this because they're incredible things that are part of this hope. Starting from verse 35 in Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things... We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I'll never forget when I was a young child when I got lost from, from mum at the shopping <coughs> centre. It was only a few minutes. Um, it felt a lot longer than that. But I remember how scared and how helpless I felt as I looked around at all these people, but I couldn't, I couldn't see mum. All I could see was strangers. And as a kid, it's a scary thing when that happens, when we can't find our parents. Actually, some kids might like it. But for me, I was, I was very scared. Because parents are, our, are, are the source of protection, aren't they? And without, without parents, kids are helpless. And sometimes kids get separated from their parents. Usually the parents find them, but sometimes they don't. And it's a shocking tragedy when that happens. It doesn't happen much in Australia, um, but it's far more common in places like India. And what a shocking thing that is. But what the scripture is telling us here is that there is nothing that can separate us from God's love. That's what we're told. Whenever we call on him as a father, he's there and he provides comfort and protection. There is no person, there is there's no circumstance, there is no distance that's far enough away where God cannot be there when we call on him. That's the promise of hope in the Bible. What an incredible thing that is. Things which are to do with our future, but things which we can experience now as well. Let's quickly go back to 1 Peter. And we'll we'll go to 1 Peter chapter 5. As he's summarising this letter to, to the believers. First Peter 5, verse 6. He says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now, there's probably very few people who we could go to and discuss, or we would feel comfortable enough to discuss our innermost fears and our innermost anxieties. Um, but part of this hope allows access to the Father through Christ, through Jesus, and we're encouraged to bring all our worries, all our fears, and place them on, him, on, on our Father because he cares for us. What a comforting message that is, um, particularly for these faithful believers who are doing it so tough. So tonight we've only really just scratched the surface of looking at hope that's found in the Bible and all the, all the incredible things that, um, that are included with this hope and involved with the future inheritance that it discusses. But really the take-home message is this, that the Bible offers a hope that is very different to all other hope that we can place our trust in. It is the only true 
source of hope that will never let us down and that will never be taken away from us. It provides a sure hope of a future that goes beyond our lives now and reveals an incredible future that will take place in a world that is transformed for the better. Not only that, but this hope can transform our lives now. It can provide us comfort, peace and joy in a world where people are living in fear for what is about to happen on this earth. But to finish tonight, let's briefly look at an analogy of this hope that Jesus taught um, in his very first set of teachings. If we come over to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus paints this picture comparing those who have hope in their lives to those who don't have hope. Matthew 7 verse 24 Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now reading through that analogy reveals that there's something that is common for all people, whether we find hope and not, or, or we don't find hope. And that is that in life, there will be hardships. In life, there will be times when, um, when there is rain. There will be times when strong winds blow and where there will be floods. And these elements will beat upon us and it will shake us from time to time. That's common among all people in all walks of life. But those who have hope are those whose foundations are sure. Those who have hope can live in confidence, knowing that no matter how strong the winds, no matter how high the flood that comes, there is nothing too powerful for God. And it is God who is keeping and reserving our internal inheritance for those who are part of his family. That's the living hope that is revealed in the Bible.